We are on Zoom, right? Zoom. Yes. And Zoom will announce normally to everyone. Yeah. It even gives an option if one doesn't agree. One can yeah, it, it would have come up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So let's get going. Uh, then, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ram, and uh, I will be your main steward for this particular program. I'm very happy to welcome you all for this. This is the first time we are launching this program in collaboration with the Bhutti College. I've been uh, just waiting for this program to get started. Uh, I'm just back from the US doing a similar program in the other end of the world. Uh, just launched a program on uh, green economy from an Indian perspective, talking to students who are doing their undergraduation course on human ecology, the College of Atlantic uh, in Maine, and uh, working with them in uh, outlining what will work for them in their context. Uh, again, when I say their context, it is completely different because we have students from several countries from across the world. So earlier we had also done this kind of a, a undergraduation, I mean a post-graduation program here in Chennai where I live. And uh, it is uh, a new I would say, venture for us to try to do this online initially and then have it as a in-person program. Originally, I think we had scheduled it to be an in-person orientation or joint session today. And because I think many people said that it would rather they would rather have it virtual and they would attend the camp towards the end, we had to rework the schedule and make it like a online program. So I'm very happy to meet you all online today. So I would like to begin with just asking you all, because there's a small group, it would be really good for all of us to get a sense of each other and introduction. I know some of you must have written something during your introduction mail, but still it will be really good now that we can see faces for people to have introduced themselves briefly to everybody else. And we get an idea of what this journey is going to be. From my side, uh, I have, uh, I would say, uh, getting even more convinced than ever before that this is the way to go. Every time I encounter a new group of people, every time I encounter a new kind of situation, I'm even more convinced that uh, for us in India to move in this space, in this direction, is going to be extremely critical. So that is uh, my conviction. I'll come into a larger introduction space later. Uh, I'm happy to have my uh, friend and colleague, Bhaskar, join me here. Bhaskar lives in Thiruvannamalai, is part of the uh, Namalwar Multiversity, which is uh, designing, developing solutions on local economies, as well as providing completely diverse kind of training programs. So, Bhaskar is loose, uh, and uh, he also has a center for learning in Thiruvannamalai currently. He's based out of there. So, thanks, Bhaskar, for joining today. So, he would probably join us also towards the end for the camp. I see Partha also here, but anyway, I'll jumping the gun already. Uh, I would rather stop now, otherwise, I'll keep talking. But we have a very good here. So, let me just go with uh, calling for introductions from all of you. Please, please, as uh, 
you know, responsible in terms of a uh, few things I would like to know from everyone is one, your own conviction, your own journey, and where are you right now? How do you see this program for you? Because uh, it's not easy for all of us to work together if we don't have a clear idea of where is everyone else is journey. For me particularly, it is very useful to get to know people. Then we can work together on a new kind of a journey together. So I would just ask one by one to go ahead or I would just have to call names, but I would like all of you to go by yourself if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you. Or maybe I'll leave Adil to do the facilitation for this. He probably knows all of you anyway. No, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ramana. No. Actually, I just know a couple of them. Uh, a lot of uh, the participants, I think, are attending a Bhumi program for the first time. Um, yeah, I can just quickly maybe introduce myself. I'm Adil. I'm part of the Bhumi team. Uh, been with Bhumi for the past decade or so. Uh, and as part of um, the alternative or you know whatever name or tag we would like to give ourselves, there are a lot of musings around um, economy, the present economic model um, that we are part of, its critique, the alternatives. Um, there's always a lot of uh, discussion on it, uh, but I've personally not been part of a deep dive into uh, what, what a green economy would look like uh, or some of the learning from, let's say, uh, Kumarappa and Gandhi. Uh, so we, I sort of know the overall um, principle and philosophy, but um, I think I'm really interested in um, going a little deeper and understanding some of these things. You know, what would, what does economic Swaraj look like? What does economy of permanence, you know, really want to get to? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm somebody with. Um, interest in economics and also trying to work with alternatives in smaller collectives and groups. So I'm really uh, looking forward. We were not sure uh, how many people would join this uh, course itself. You know, we think economy is very abstract. So I'm happy to see uh, all of you here and uh, happy to have uh, Ramana facilitating the entire, uh, anchoring the entire course. So yeah, that's me. Um, should I tag somebody or should, can people just, I, Ram, Mana, you are on mute. I couldn't hear you. Sorry, you have, you tag the next person. That's easier. Great, great. Okay. I'll tag Ashwini. Thank you. Thank you, Adil Bhai. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Ashwini and uh, native of Uttarakhand. That is where I have been brought up, brown up. <laughs> but have lived all over the places in India. Uh, currently, I am one of the co-creators at Travelers University. So it's an organization where we facilitate experiential learning programs through travel. And we are building short-term as well as long-term programs wherein people can use travel as a pedagogy for their own learning, which is both external and internal. And... Uh, uh, my interest in economics has been throughout, like from starting only, even though I haven't studied economics as such in a formal way. Uh, but like uh, the interaction with economics is every day, you know, it is part of our life. So the question of uh, how to navigate it, how to interact with it has been, has been always very alive. And in my personal life also, I feel uh, from an entrepreneur to a person who has been dependent on a salary at the end of the month to a, again... Uh, where we don't know where the money will come from. It is a constant journey of my relationship with the economics and my relationship with the money that I have been continuously exploring. And some of the things that we talk about, shared economy, uh, commons, and uh, um, relying on barter systems, uh, experiencing abundance, you know, sharing and all, has been part of TU as well as my, li uh, my personal life because that is how we have been uh, that is how we have been functioning in the last four to five years. And from this course, like uh, I think as Adil said, it is mostly from listening to people. I have been influenced by Hind Suraj because that has been a really has been one of the influence in my life. I, I've read that I was part of a circle. 
so have knows bits and pieces of it but not in a structured way or not in a way where i can piece all those pieces together so that is one of the intention that i carry from this course of uh, maybe giving a structure to what the little bit pieces that i already know and also the new things that i will be getting to know through this program so yeah that's the stage that i'm right now and thank you thank you for for doing this program for to bumi and samanya i also personally feel that it's it's one of the need of the art especially talking to youth because we mostly work with youth so that is one of the first question that everybody has you know how does the economics of this place uh, uh, so it's a very pertinent question for uh, all of us that ways and i'll tag uh, pooja thank you thank you ashwini hello everyone um I'm presently working in an aerospace company. It's totally different from sustainability and uh, green economy. I don't have any background in eco economics as such, but I've been uh, very interested in this field. I've been reading about it and my journey until now has been very personal. I've not interacted with other people working in similar uh, areas and uh, but I'm, I want to do a career switch. I want to learn a lot about this. And I'm also pursuing a part-time degree in sustainability. And uh, this is at Harvard. And uh, most of the perspectives that they put on sustainability is mostly from the US perspective. But I have been thinking uh, Indian perspective would be very different. And uh, culturally also, I think we are more aligned towards sustainability and it would be easier for us to switch um, rather than, you know, blindly following their perspectives. And another uh, aspect about this course that uh, made me feel interested is uh, the Gandhian perspectives, uh, right? I, I have been reading about Mahatma Gandhi and uh, have been inspired by his thoughts and yeah, uh, you you know, even 100 years ago, he was talking about sustainability then. And, you, you know, having that going uh, by his teachings, there, there's a lot we can learn and apply, I guess. So I I look forward to learning a lot. And uh, I'm, a, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Buja. Would you like to tag somebody? Yeah, um, maybe Ananya. Okay, hello, uh, I'm Ananya. So I'm, I was a Bumi fellow uh, last year and I'm currently on a path of exploration trying to figure out different possibilities for myself. So I've been interested in writing media and communications and all of that and also I'm, I'm a nature lover. I've been a nature lover since childhood and I've been passionate about sustainability and alternatives and how we can bring in uh, possibilities of uh, sustainability. Also using my uh, passion for writing and communications as a tool to build communities and share stories of hope, all of that. So also me along with my father was also attending the session uh, we were working on something called Go Green Guru. It's like a platform to around sustainability and bringing more conversations, more stories of hope, sharing all those stories for us to learn more about different things people are doing and the different possibilities that exist. And also starting a podcast related to that and building a community, trying to do different experiments on how do we make bring things forward. So right now, uh, so I'm on that path. And in terms of economics, so I don't have any like formal understanding of economics as such, but I'm, I'm kind of curious about learning about different concepts. So maybe we did a, some kind of brief learning. So we had some conversations. We read about circular economy in a way, like, there are some concepts around that. And even at Bumi, during the fellowship, we also did different things like sharing circle, where we where we look at economics beyond just the financial aspects, but also how do we look at the various forms of capital that are there in our life as well, like emotional, people, all of that. How do we look at everything in a form of a balance in cyclical systems? 
how do we look at things so i'm interested how do we bring in the systemic aspect like how how do we uh, bring all these concepts on a systemic level and apply them in our real life as well like to the world so that we can transition to something which is more sustainable and sane uh, so curious about how do we explore these what are the possibilities and also communicate them and uh, make make it happen and how local economy or circular economy or uh, different kinds of sharing so all of that there i'm curious about different things so i've joined out of a curiosity to learn from this community here thank you ananya would you mind tagging somebody yes uh, nitya yeah hello everyone good morning i'm so happy to be part of this course and thank you for uh, yeah initiating and organizing this course um currently i live in mysore and i'm a homemaker i take care of my kids they are like 5 years and 3 year old mm, i do composting i mean i'm have all this question i mean why is there so much waste and shouldn't we manage our own waste so i do composting segregate my own waste <clears throat> make my own bio enzymes uh prepare like laundry detergent and uh, all that so um there's a there's a my background is i'm an engineer and i've worked in uh, waste treatment and uh, sewage treatment plants i've been a proposal engineer and i've designed and uh, the stps and all that so um yeah here i'm i get my vegetables from a small farmers house like the uh, the farmers like four or five farmers near my so they come and sell here so they have informal uh, community dialogues kind of thing so there i gave workshops like people were interested on bioenzymes and composting so i gave workshops on that and many people were interested in composting so i did help them all that so and then i started thinking so why is it there so much waste and people are interested to manage their own waste but still there's so much waste piling up it keeps coming and coming so just managing the waste doesn't solve the problem that's when i thought about other things okay economy so that shapes our day to day activities so i think shaping the economy redirecting our economy will help us reduce our waste so and that's when i wanted i was i was questioning myself i was searching for answers and i just uh saw about this course so i was like okay this is seems really interesting and i think this could give me an answer or help me or give me a direction to help myself and the community also yeah that's thank you thank you thank you nitya would you mind tagging ஜி <laughs> we actually didn't have any psychology subject back there in our bachelors and it was also mostly based on western philosophy um more recently from the last year or so i've been uh, more interested in going back to my own roots um and trying to understand the wisdom and the knowledge that is embedded in our culture in our literature uh, shastras and um, indian philosophy um i also recently read the donut economics uh which is again rethinking economic models but uh it is again based on a western thought so i could resonate with a lot of things that are uh, there in the book i'm writing a book myself on climate change from an india perspective um i am planning to switch into this field and build my career until i retire in this uh field 
And I feel that the narrative around climate change is also, again, very Western. Um, I feel a lot of those solutions that the West is recommending may or may not apply to India, our culture, our ethos. Um, so this course was my way of understanding Indian philosophy, um, hopefully bringing it in the book. Um, I'm also doing a course on Veda, so some of the knowledge that I'm gaining from there also will go into the book. And uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, that's why I joined this course and I'm really, really looking forward to it. I'll pick, uh, who's left? Deepak. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm sorry if it is too loud. I'm taking this call from a cafe because I feel trying to get something to print for the festival. Uh, I'm part of uh, I'm part of Bumi right now as a team. Uh, I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a performing artist. I do contemporary dance. My engagement with economy has been just survival all my life, uh, and I've done my fellowship at Bumi, and I got really interested in looking at all the things which is alternative, and one of the main things that we tend to forget is money. And uh, I've been looking at different ways of engaging with economy because the way that we were offered as students when we were studying was very confusing for me. So I've uh, been uh, observing what, uh, what things are happening in alternative world, and one of the, one of the dreams is also to figure out ways to embody economy to a body, which I know which is a bit uh, of a question mark because uh, we're still trying to figure out, but I want to understand economy from a perspective and I'm really looking forward to share any information that I have or share things that can be helpful for the group. Uh, who is left? I think I was also off for a while, so can I tag Adil back? I think I've shared. Uh, Partha, Partha, would you like to quickly share? Yeah. Partha, you're on mute. Uh, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Good morning. Um, yeah, it's an uh, course which I was also looking forward for a long time because for liking, we like or not, we are part of a big uh, uh, economic system um, throughout our life, uh, which is uh, moving at a fast pace. Like it was industrialization, then harmonization, it become, uh, um, and we call capitalism. Now it's a become a hyper capitalism where it's accelerating uh, our lifestyles more and more um, in a different direction altogether. And, uh, it's also depleting natural resources in an accelerating form, right? So um, what is an alternative to it? Uh, people said, uh, think globally, act globally. Then they said, think globally, act locally. I think what really what we need is think locally and act locally. I think that is what uh, uh, this green economy um, would take us, uh, 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 take help us to take a U-turn and move forward in a holistic way. So I'm looking forward uh, more in this journey uh, to unlearn and learn, and also part of this uh, green economy uh, movement, which I think is necessary at the time of the hour. And thanks to Ram uh, Ramana for uh, putting together uh, uh, a, a good orientation for all of us. Thank you, thank you, Bar Partha. I think uh, yeah. Baskar Ranna is also part of. Maybe we should, you know, he can share. I would tag yeah. Baskar. Yeah. Uh, no, no, Tamil language is here. Mudra English is translated. எல்லாருக்கும் வணக்கம் மகிழ்ச்சியா இருக்கிற விஷயம் என்னன்னா ஒரு தொடர்ச்சியா இந்த பசுமை அல்லது கிரீன் எக்கனாமின்னு சொல்லக்கூடிய விஷயத்துக்காக ஒரு பத்து பேர் கூடி பேசுறோங்கிறது இன்னைய காலகட்டத்துக்கு பெரிய விஷயம்தான் அந்த வகையில கோர்ஸா போறதுக்கு முன்னாடி எனக்கு வந்து இந்த குழுவுல அதிகமான பெண்களும் பங்கு பெற்று இருக்கிறது வந்து பெண்களும்னு சொல்றத விட 
சமம் சமமாக இல்லாமல் அதுக்கும் கூட பெண்கள் இது மேலே ரொம்ப கவனம் செலுத்திருக்கிறது வந்து ரொம்ப நல்ல விஷயமா இருக்கு ஏன்னா இப்போ பல இடங்களில் போகும்போது ஆண் முகங்களாகவே பார்த்து பழகியிருப்போம் அவர்களுடைய கருத்துக்கு மட்டுமே இடம் இருக்கிற மாதிரியும் அவர்களுடைய விளையாடலுக்கு மட்டுமே இடம் இருக்கிற மாதிரியும் தான் பெரும்பாலுமான அரசியல் நிகழ்வுகள்ல இருக்கு கல்வியில இருக்கலாம் குடும்பத்துக்குள்ள இருக்கலாம் ஆனா முடிவெடுக்கிற வர இடத்துல வந்து பெண்களுடைய எண்ணிக்கை குறைவா இருக்கு அப்போ இந்த ஒட்டுமொத்த கிரீன் எக்கனாமி பத்தி பேசும்பொழுது ஒரு முறை ராமண்ணன் சொல்லியிருந்தாங்க இதை பத்தி காந்தி பேசினதோ குமரப்பா பேசினதோ பேசும்பொழுது இந்த பெண்கள் தலைமை பண்புக்கு வந்த பின்னாடி அவங்க எடுக்கக்கூடிய முடிவுகள்ல தான் இந்த சஸ்டைனபிலிட்டியை மாற வாய்ப்பு இருக்கு அதை நோக்கி நகர வேண்டிய அவசியமும் இந்த பசுமை பொருளாதாரத்துல இருக்கு அப்படின்னு ஒரு முறை நம்ம பேசியிருக்கோம் அந்த வகையில இது தனிப்பட்ட மாற்றங்கள் நிகழ்ந்து கொண்டேதான் இருக்கு இது ஒட்டுமொத்தமாக சமூகத்தை பத்தின சிந்தனையா இருக்க வேண்டியிருக்கு அதுல அரசியலும் பெரும் பங்கு வகிக்க வேண்டியிருக்கு அதனால எனக்கு இந் இந்த செஷன் உள்ள வந்ததுமே ஒரு ஒரு அனக்டோடுக்கு கலைஞர் சொன்ன அனக்டோட் ஞாபகத்துக்கு வருது அவருக்கும் பொருளாதாரத்துக்கு என்ன சம்மந்தம் இல்லை ஆனா அந்த அனக்டோட் ஞாபகத்துக்கு வருது பசிக்காக ஆகாரத்தை தின்று குளத்தை சுத்தம் செய்கிறத மீன் அந்த மாதிரி தான் என்னுடைய சுயநலம் அதுல பொது நலமும் அடங்கியிருக்கு அப்படின்னு ஒரு இடத்துல எழுதியிருப்பாரு மறுபடியும் கூட சொல்றேன் பசிக்காக அழுக்கை தின்று அந்த குளத்தை சித்தம் செய்கிறது மீன் அந்த மாதிரி தான் என்னோட சுயநலம் அதுல பொது நலமும் இருக்கு அப்படின்னு அவர் பேசினது இந்த கோர்ஸ்க்குள்ள வரும்பொழுது முன்னாடி நான் யோசி யோசிச்சேன் காரணம் என்னன்னா இப்ப நம்ம யோசிக்கிறதெல்லாம் நம்மளுடைய பர்சனல் மாற்றம்ன்றது ஒரு வகையில சுயநலமா தெரியலாம் ஆனா அதுல தான் பொது நலமும் அடங்கியிருக்கு அதை பத்தின டெக்னிக்கா இல்லாம அதை பத்தின மாரல் எத்திக்ஸ் வேல்யூ ப்ராசஸ் இதை பத்தி தான் நம்ம நிறைய பேச போறோம்னு நினைக்கிறேன் அந்த வகையில எல்லாருக்கும் வாழ்த்துக்களும் நன்றியும் சொல்லிக்கிறேன் இந்த விஷயத்த தொடர்ச்சியா முன்னெடுக்கக்கூடிய அதற்கான உழைப்ப நேரத்தை அதிகம் போடக்கூடிய ராமனோட சேர்ந்து பயணிக்கிறதுல மகிழ்ச்சி அவருக்கும் இதுல நான் சொல்லிக்கிறேன் சொல்லலாம் ஜேர்னி towards green economy he is happy to see uh, like though it's a, a small group very uh, focused group so in that sense he is very happy to see the uh, participants diversity in this group and he was happy to see a lot of uh, uh, women has joined the group because he feels changes uh, change influence happens uh, mostly uh, effectively done by uh, women than men so in that sense he is happy to see all the participants and majority of the participants being uh, women and uh, he was quoting um, one of the politician from tamil nadu who said that uh, uh, i want to be like a fish though uh, uh, my selfish motive is to eat so i eat the dirt in the pond and make the pond clean so in that sense uh, he said it's a slow it's a selfish motive uh, we all Uh, have a larger yeah. role to play in clearing up the mess created by the uh, the so called modern economy the modern economics mostly is human centric uh, where it excludes uh, all other species of the uh, in this uh, environment um, and, uh, so he's happy to have this journey along with ramana this, this is the uh, summary of what uh, baskarana spoke Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot, you. all of you, for fantastic sharing. Uh, it's been really wonderful. Adil, I'll go now. Is it okay? Yes, yes, Ramana. Fine. So, I should share here, I mean, listening to some of you, I was like completely amazed at uh, almost the parallels with my own journey, particularly when, you know, 
I think I just Ira Swasti when she spoke about it, and uh, I think uh, somebody else also mentioned earlier. Uh, I was in the corporate sector in the early 90s and uh, challenging a lot of questions about Western form of uh, management concepts being imposed in India. Those days working in quality management, particularly in the process industry. My question was, why is it that we need to borrow Western concepts to study management in the Indian context? Those days, the most popular thing in quality management was uh, uh, not just the uh, Western concepts, but we were also borrowing from Japanese. And it was hilarious sometimes when uh, you read American authors, Eastern concept of management for them came from Japan. As though anything Eastern was reduced to this small group of islands, Japanese. And uh, India and China and everybody else did not have much to contribute in any way to their understanding. Subsequently, when China's growth came in the global economy got noticed, there were uh, uh, Chinese expats living in the U.S., who started writing about Chinese management concepts. I still remember, I think, uh, Chin Ning Chu, I think in the 90s, wrote uh, Thick Face Black Heart. That was one of the earliest books I remember that came about, which explained about the Chinese form of economy, or Chinese attitude towards economy. This is almost like competing with the Japanese, because the Japanese had already dominated the quality management show in the 90s. Kaizen was already very popular in the West. People are talking about Kaizen. There were this five West concept and various concepts that were being spoken of at that time. So in India, a small group of us started talking about Indian system of management. And uh, that is where my journey started in looking at alternatives. I come from a mainstream corporate background. In those days, I used to do consultancy in the mainstream corporate IT sector companies. I was in SCI level five kind of a company that is Software Engineering Institute. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University had uh, proposed this uh, capability maturity model, what we called uh, level zero to five, etc. those days. I used to design process modeling, project management. But our fundamental question was, is there something Indian that India got to contribute? So when we started this, many of us started going into the scriptures. We said, okay, the scriptures in India do have a lot. So whether it is the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads or the Tirukkural or any of the texts that is available. Because we, I came from, a, a, like all of us do, right? When we come from educated space where we think the written word is what takes precedence over everything else. So I started looking at uh, many of this. Those days it was very easy to access Bhagavad Gita and Tirukkural. In Tamil Nadu, we used to access Tirukkural. And um, what is available across India was Bhagavad Gita. And we try to develop management concepts around this. So in the early 90s, we came up with things like uh, Arjuna model of leadership, Raja Rishi, Rishi model of uh, wise leadership for corporates, and uh, several such concepts and theories we came up with. Uh, some of the popular people those days who were uh, influencing this particular body of knowledge that evolved in the 90s, where uh, N.H. Uh, Atreya, uh, who was one of the senior most management consultants those days. We also had uh, uh, the younger Atreya, who was uh, more popular in Delhi. Uh, he had just then set up the, I think, Shisharada Institute of Management in Delhi. We also had... Uh, uh, Swami Someshwarananda, who had set up the Vivekananda Center for Indian Management in Indore. I worked very closely with this Swamiji for a while. 
Swami Jitatma Nanda of the Rajkot Ashram of Ramakrishna Mission, who wrote Indian Ethos in Management, which was a very popular book in those days. And uh, there are several other corporate practitioners who had moved to understanding where the is there a Indian system of management. So by the time I left the corporate sector in the 1998 and started summoned by my consulting firm, uh, I had by then completely mentally started to look at alternatives as a way of thinking. Can we think beyond the existing uh, management theories and concepts and can we evolve something locally independent? Thankfully for me, around that time, I had a chance encounter with a Gandhian thinker by name Dharampal. And Dharampal brought in several ways of understanding and looking at issues which were completely different from what I had understood earlier. For instance, he shifted my entire thinking from scripture and text based to what is the oral tradition and people based, people institution based. The second part of the change that came into my understanding was almost a renewed interest in Gandhi. Because like any urban child who grew up in India in the 90s or even now, I would say, we are taught in schools more reasons to hate Gandhi than to like Gandhi. Right. Because uh, I always maintain there are like six to seven different Gandhis that are prevalent in the Indian context. There is a leftist Gandhi, there is a rightist Gandhi, there is a Gandhi and Gandhi uh, who is uh, celebrated, deified and uh, put in a pedestal and worshipped and not to be bothered to understood. I have Gandhians who have told me, very celebrated Gandhians who have told me that, uh, like Ashwini said, you know, Hind Swaraj and bits and pieces, you know, people who have said that I can read Gandhi's life. My auto autobiography is easy. My experiments with truth is easy. But working with Gandhi, Hind Swaraj is difficult. The head of a famous Gandhian institution once told me, look, after the third chapter, I put down Hind Swaraj every time. Beyond the fourth chapter, I am unable to proceed because Hinsuraj is a very difficult thing. Why did he say such things? Why was he so against all these things? Why against doctors? Why against lawyers? Why against uh, 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 railways? So this entire thing of even Gandhians couldn't handle Gandhi. Hinsuraj is one of those rebellious texts that Gandhians find it difficult to engage with it. They like this... Uh, Better Indian kind of a Gandhi. Nice soft stories about positive things that are happening to the world and how you can engage with them. And that is what Gandhi is reduced to already. Because even Gandhi is repackaged in the West and sent back to us as a apostle of peace and non-violence rather than the rebel that he was. That man was a rebel of the finest Indian kind. As India, I think the fundamental character of Indians is to rebel. That's one of my understanding that I derived from Dharampal. And subsequently, Dharampal also pointed out something very fascinating and interesting. He said Gandhi picked up many of his ideas from ordinary Indians, whether it is Sal Satyagraha or the spinning wheel. These were practices that he picked up. He basically took off small ideas from ordinary Indians and converted them into a major mission or a major activity or something that is with which which could be practiced by everyone but which could have a consequence at a much larger space. This is the uniqueness of Gandhi. And Dharampal used to always say, and working with Dharampal was that way fantastic because for the next six, seven years till he passed away, I managed to work with him. And uh, in the process, I learned that one needs to, if one wants to understand the real Indian systems and processes, one needs to go beyond the scriptures. Scriptures are theories of what is already in practice. If you take any scripture, if you take a Upanishad, Upanishad starts by saying, Atha, that is how it was said. Uh, 
this is how it was said you know the most of your scriptures start by saying this is how it was practiced like uh, when hottest malabarika was first compiled this is the first largest pharmacopoeia compilation that happens in india uh basically what they do uh, the britishers have done is they come put together a committee of people who are compiling the pharmacopoeia from what is practiced in the indian scripture this is what is put together but the best part of it is once they start compiling it is only the existing knowledge pre existing knowledge similarly if you look at tamil scriptures any of the old tamil scriptures because now we understand and it is acknowledged and clearly said that tamil is even older than uh, uh, the known antiquity in terms of knowledge it has been longer than many other indian languages even in tirukkural or any other tamil scripture we always find this is how it was said tiruvallur always acknowledges that this is how it was practiced this is how it was said this is how this was understood so every indian scripture at every point seems to be acknowledging that this was there in practice practice is what is written and not the other way around the book didn't come first the practice came first and then the book was an attempt to theorize um in fact uh, this led me to several other understandings uh, one was to understand how people systems work and how communities work so sometime in the early part of the this century when uh, 2004 5 that period i got an opportunity to understand how the social security networks are managed among small communities in tamil nadu so for about 2 years i was involved in a research program that was understanding how do people manage themselves how do rural communities manage themselves in the process got to study a whole lot of management systems that is not written anywhere they couldn't even cite in fact when one of them when i saw it was one of the most amazing management system and when i asked asking them uh, where did you get this from they said well this is how it has been practiced forever and i asked them further no it must have been written somewhere give me a document I remember this uh, uh, village community elder going in and pulling out one piece of old crumpled piece of booklet. He said, "Well, if you want something written, here is this written piece." Majority of the insights that people had was a oral tradition, or something that is already in practice. People did not really have something in. Uh, i would say you know a written form because uh, writing is so recent for us and i think we are far more expressive as a oral community our power is in the oral traditions and today we have to acknowledge that the written tradition in india is like a infinitely small part of the oral tradition a oral tradition is far more stronger far more profound because the oral tradition communicates itself in so many diverse genres you know it it could be uh, theater it could be performance it could be uh, storytelling uh, it 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 comes up in so many ways and the encounters with the modern economic system particularly the economic organization that we find and how it encounters and negotiates its way, way with the modern economic system both of the state and of the market became a far more fascinating area for me to study in fact i still remember i used to visit this community that has become extremely dominant in economic activity in one particular part of tamil nadu and um, by way of introduction the person who took me would say this person used to work for it and they were a bit wary they were kind of step back and say it which it and they thought it was income tax and i had to quickly clarify and say no 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 i worked in the information technology place computer and all these things you know and i had nothing to do with income tax they'll never open up 
majority of the big trading communities in India, I think, still maintain two sets of books. Uh, probably Mr. Ambani does it in a more sophisticated manner than other people. So the one for the government and the one for themselves. Everybody does it. And I am I was not surprised to find out more and more about it when I started interacting with these communities. In, a, in, in Tamil Nadu, for instance, one of the most interesting things that happens is village panchayats have the uh, fishing rights in villages are auctioned by the village panchayat. Okay. So now if there is a village pond, the pond is auctioned. The fishing rights in the pond is auctioned. And uh, subsequently, the money goes into the panchayat. Now, typically in a panchayat system, what happens is the money is taken to the state level, the treasury, and the treasury decides how much of it gets allocated from the tax money to which part of the which panchayat or to which municipality, etc. And then that money is sent back again to the village. And eventually the village decides what to spend. The panchayat will decide. So now we have this village panchayat that is elected by the government. And then there is the village panchayat that is run by the community. In most villages, that is prevalent. Nobody will tell you this unless you they trust you or you are introduced by the right kind of people. Nobody actually bothers to tell you that the village panchayat is only an elected body. There is also uh, another kind of panchayat. Sometimes it is called the jati panchayat. It's a caste-based panchayat system. There are single caste villages in which the village caste dominant community, whichever, they have their own panchayat and then they have a elders panchayat. Uh, they have the elected panchayat system of the government. So, Till recent times, and I suspect even today, there are panchayats in Tamil Nadu where the pond fishing rights are first auctioned by the government panchayat for something like 5,000 rupees for the year, which is like everybody knows is negligible amount and really doesn't justify anything. And after the village accountant leaves the place, the same thing is auctioned again. The real auction takes place. Where they auction it again and they probably make about a lakh and a half. Why? What is the difference? What is the financial difference in the models? The second system, the money never leaves the village. The money stays in the village and converts itself into an asset for the entire community. In the first system, it goes into the block, district, I mean, the, the tassel, and from there to the district and to the state, exchequer, and then comes back again all the way to the village. The second system, it remains in the village. One can say this is the way in which the existing democratic system of governance itself is completely debased in this country. People are chipping away at corners all the time, and everybody is chipping away like this. This is like Continuously happen. And I remember when I first shared it, I was shocked when I first heard about it when I was doing my uh, study on this. And then I realized most of the government officials are aware of this practice. And they think this is justifiable. For me, I was shocked. I thought, like, how could you justify something like this? How do you even... Uh, in fact, uh, I still remember Madras High Court, somebody filed a case against Jati Panchayats in Madras High Court. And uh, said uh, all, and the uh, High Court passed a order for 10, 15 years ago, saying the government should submit a report saying Jati Panchayat system has been quashed. That all Jati Panchayat system has been uh, disbanded in the state. Uh, now, very interesting thing happened. I think after six months, the government, uh, uh, when the case came up for hearing and the court was going to review this particular process, one of the interesting things that happened was the government said uh, we couldn't see where it is available, so we don't know what we are going to uh, uh, kind of unstructure. 
because if only you knew this is not a legal entity they don't advertise themselves they don't have a letterhead jati panchayats do not have a registered office they are not a legal entity so which is the entity that you will go and actually address what is the entity that you will actually go and dismantle it doesn't because the government only recognize that which is in paper not that which is in practice this is fully in practice and nothing is on paper that is the challenge so every encounter between the existing economic system that is what we think is the system and that which is in practice which is this massive 85% of the country there is a huge amount of learning there is an enormous amount of challenges and to a large extent this is what came to a boil with the demonetization because if you remember the rationale for demonetization was that there is a large amount of cash economy that is prevalent and the cash economy could be illegal right and i'm just breaking it down to the simplest kind of a way in which it was interpreted uh we all know what happened almost the entire cash that was available supposedly on date was <laughs> remitted to the back to the uh system and uh, so the entire idea of cash economy being not uh when legal was completely dismantled i mean that the idea was dismantled and what it ended up doing was it ended up also the collateral damage in the demonetization process was a complete uh change in the attitude towards the banking system banking system which is the front end of our economy the organized economy to the poor people and the ordinary people of this land people started having less faith in the banking system post to demonetization this was brought out to me when i had a group of uh, economic students visiting me once they came and uh, i was supposed to give a talk to them they were spending one full day with me uh, we have the center in oroville um, sustainable livelihood institute for which i was director for uh, several years since it was founded we used to have students visiting us so we had these economic students from some part of india visiting us it was in the middle of demonetization process immediately after i think about a about a month after the demonetization came to be so when i started talking about concepts on indian economy or gandhian economy one of these young bright students stood up put up his hand and said all this is very theoretical it is not practical this doesn't work ठीक है भैया सो लेट अस सी व्हाट हैपेंस इन सो व्हाट आई सेड आई सेड फाइन नाउ व्हाट वी विल डू इज वी विल नॉट डिस्कस एनीथिंग नाउ सो व्हाट आई हैड डन वाज आई हैड ऑर्गेनाइज्ड फॉर ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स टू बी ग्रुप्ड एंड टेकन टू डिफरेंट प्लेसेस इन द विलेज एंड दे वेंट एंड आई गिव देम ओनली टू और थ्री क्वेश्चंस आई टोल्ड देम गो sit in the local tea shop observe how the economy operates the village tea shop another group went to a local market a third group went to the sabzi mandi the fourth group went to a lady who was selling fish in the road side so my team took them to various places they sat together and they actually uh, observed them i told them ask them only two or three things i told them look you can ask any questions to them but remember i want you to find out two things from them when they are in trouble whom do they borrow from right if they have a cash crunch whom do they borrow from two when they have a business decision to make and if they need some advice whom do they go to i said these two questions alone you find out the answer the rest of it you ask them any question anything it doesn't matter so when they came back in the afternoon i sat with them again and i asked him did you guys go find out what it find out so this young man who was like putting up his hand in the morning saying all this is humbug you know he kind of put up his hand again and he said look i want to share something that happened to me so fine 
and then he starts cleaning. He went and he was with this lady who was selling fish in the roadside. She's a pavement hawker. She's been selling fish. She asked her, how long have you been selling fish here? She says, 30 years. 30 years you've been selling fish in the same side, same roadside? She says, yes, I'm happy. She says, yes, I'm happy. Then he says, he looks, points at the shop behind her and says, when are you going to set up a shop like this? She says, no, I'm happy selling fish in the roadside. Why should I set up a shop? This man is a bright young economy student. So he thinks things should go linearly. You know, if you have been doing this roadside shop, now you should set up your own shop. You should have a retail unit yourself. And then while he's sitting there, there is this lady who seems to be a regular customer who walks in. And she is negotiating for a fish. And there is a big haggling going on. They argue. And then finally this woman takes the fish. And then after taking the fish, she says, like everybody else, what we were all doing during demonetization, right? Um, Modi Baba, you know, you know, demonetization, no cash. I'll give you money later. So <laughs> she blames it on Modi Ji. And she says, um, no money in my hand. I'll give you money later. And uh, as she's walking away, this fish vendor, she calls her back. She says, don't you have guests at home? So he says, yes, I have guests at home still. He says, how is that fish enough for you if you have guests at home? Take this also. So he gives her an additional piece of fish to catch. This guy says, this completely beat me. Here is somebody who is not even paying her. And she is not even getting any uh, money right now. And she has just finished a big argument with this person. And then she is actually offering something more. And then he asked her a question. Uh, will you note down these things? How much anybody owes you? Will you write it down somewhere? This lady says, no. I don't write it down. He said, how do you remember? Says, yeah, I'll remember. And then he says, what if you forget? She says, well, if I forget, my customers will not forget. And uh, then he says, uh, do you have a bank account? She says, no, I don't have a bank account. Ask him, why? She says, look, look at me. I went thrice to the bank to start my own bank account. But every time I went to the bank, they disrespected me. I go after I finish selling my fish. So I obviously go with my basket. But when I go in, they kind of ask me to sit in a corner. They say, hey, you smell too much, you stink too much, you know. Come some other time. They don't respect me. A system that doesn't respect me, why should I go there? So I only run to work on cash amount. So this man who was protesting about any form of informal economy in the morning, came back with a completely new understanding in the afternoon. Just by sitting and observing and just by talking to people. So my understanding of Indian systems or Indian economy that actually functions, which employs the unorganized sector in India is supposed to employ more than 80% of the employed population in this country. And if we are directed by a different ethos, the unorganized sector, that builds on relationships, that works as a relationship as a core of the economy, where individual relationship with each other dictates how the economy operates. And then we go around claiming that we are the world's largest workforce. That means the largest workforce in the world is directed and dictated by an ethical principle that is completely different from what your mainstream economy keeps on telling you. That is what they teach you, the microeconomy, macroeconomy, mathematical equation of economy, and all these different things they teach you as part of a curriculum in any economic undergraduation, postgraduation course in this country. We have not incorporated that which the, the ethos that actually contributes towards employing the largest number of people in this country. We haven't theorized it. We haven't understood it. We haven't articulated it. Often we keep uh, putting it down because we are taught something else is the mainstream and this is an alternate. 
This is not the alternative, boss. This is the mainstream. This is what 80% of your people are doing. Maybe Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani do not invest in this. But if this collapses, they all also collapse. Because this is what sustains everybody else. So what is this form of effort? What is this ethics that sustains people? That is what I have been working on. For me, relationship as a whole and the ethics and the principles that these people incorporate into their systems. This is what I have been studying by working with communities in small villages, by looking at how people operate. How do our ordinary people operate? That is what fascinates me. And that is what has made me work in this space. And today when I look at it, and um, I know I am kind of using the first session to more as a storytelling session. It's a very conscious session on my part. Uh, I will get into conceptualizing many of these and presenting them as individual concepts subsequently. Uh, it's just that post-pandemic, I have got out of this habit of running presentations first time I meet people. I am more consciously trying to get to know people and relate with people first than to do this very... Um, I would say very inhuman way of running slideshows and telling things. And this is much more easier for me to do this because this way I am at least relating to you and to some of you, at least I can see your responses and it's easier for me. So please do stop me if you want me to con discontinue or if you want me to clarify something further. I have already taken notes, but I will take more notes. And... Uh, Many of these I have tried to put down, I mean, though I am running through this as a storytelling right now, each one of these I have tried to theorize and I pulled in a lot of things from my experience, insights, as well as what I have studied in smaller institutions into concepts, how this particular system of economy seems to operate. I think it's high time we do it. Uh, Dharampal, again, I keep bringing back the Rampal into many of my sayings because I have been very highly influenced by this Gandhian thinker. And he used to always put it in a very succinct manner. He used to, in fact, uh, once uh, uh, we had uh, uh, one of the ideologues of uh, a major ideological movement in India uh, talking to him. And uh, this gentleman kept asking the Rampal, you know, uh, Bharatiya Desh, Itna, we are so great, we are so great about these, that and all that. So Dharampal kind of looked at him suddenly and turned around and asked him, so tell me, what is so great about this country? What's so great about India? And this is a question. You know? So this gentleman, of course, he, he could have been an ideologue outside, but with the Gandhian, you'll have to be you can't pretend too much, right? So he, he kind of said, Aap bataiye. Aap, because he's like elderly person, right? You know, smart thing is when an elderly person asks you, tell me what is, what is this? You know, whatever you answer might be wrong. So, you know, because you will know that this person is going to anyway surprise you. So this person said, uh, Aap, Aap bataiye. Aap. What is so great? Then Dharampal, in his own characteristic way, he said, the greatness of this country is the ordinary people of this land have understood that everything in nature is connected. And they have built their way of life around this understanding. This understanding is what they have built their way of life. Now, this is something very beautiful and very profound, I found. Because Gandhi somewhere, when he's uh, talking about Indian civilization, and uh, for those of you who might have read Gandhi, Gandhi was very clear-cut on this. He said Indian civilization is the greatest civilization in the world. I mean, that man had no qualms or uh, uh, any doubts about stating it. He says, my civilization is the best civilization in the world, period. That's it. Yeah, I have limitations. I have had problems. But I will sort them out. But mine is the best. This is something that he seems to be very clear about. 
and then he says everything if everything in the civilization disappears everything in india disappears all forms and all traces disappear if this one line remains the whole place can be recreated the entire ethos of the civilization can be recreated and for that he says the first line of the first upanishad isha vasyam idam sarvam is the isha upanishad we say that isha vasyam idam sarvam that which is there everything is connected or placed in the idea of the divine and darampal was actually referring to that when he said that the ordinary people of this land have figured out that everything is connected with each other and this was brought out to me much much later in a completely different space i did not even expect once we were in a village in near kolkata tamil nadu and we were sitting together discussing what is sustainable development so anyway this is maybe where i pause i will have to ask you many of you are in this for green economy right so what is your definition of sustainable development can any one of you give uh, what will be an indian definition of sustainable development if we are we are indians right so if we were to define from scratch sustainable development from a indian point of view what will be our definition what can be can somebody attempt it you can put it down in the chat in case you don't want to talk about it or if somebody can articulate try articulating what would be our definition in my this thing understanding uh, it would be some the, anything which is done with consciousness development which is done with a conscience okay so at the fundamental distal level that is what my understanding of sustainable development is okay i'm going to record uh, what is being said as a text for my own reference uh thank you something which works for everyone and everyone as in for for the different species that inhabit earth so the rest of nature the humans but at the humans also which is not working for just some people but which works for everyone in the sense like uh, so so and including the rest of nature because that is an important stakeholder and as you said everything is connected so if one thing there is an impact on one aspect it is going to impact the other aspect we might not see it at that point but in eventually it is going to uh, plan you know play out in the open that way yeah. thank you that's wonderful i mean that's i mean you brought it out very well um, any other attempts anybody else uh, so i feel sustainable development is again yeah something which recognizes the interdependence among all beings on all beings be it humans or all all creatures or yeah. even our physical environment nature element. all the elements of nature so uh, recognizing interdependence and uh, coexistence of different beings and the circularity like one thing it's not like one linear thing that this is one way of doing it but all the different systems they just go hand in hand and in in their own circles circles of life like even if you look at what is cycle or anything right everything in nature has its own cycle so also recognizing that fluidity that cyclicity in the economic system as well okay Great. Anybody else wants to take a shot at this? I think. I think. Please, please, somebody. No, go ahead. Somebody, I think, wanted to share. I wanted to share. Is there anyone else who wanted to? Ira, I can go next. Next. After Ira, Adil. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking it right now. I think sustainability. sustainable development is something which can sustain for a long time development that can sustain for a long time and from that um, something that is long term 
is actually so when decisions are taking taken thinking of the long term and instead of the short term and somewhere i'm including the the path of shreyas and prayas like some decisions that lead to short term gratification or instant gratification but fail in the long run versus uh that is good in the long run but may be painful or inconvenient in right now in the present okay great uh, adil no you are muted adil yeah i think um, just a couple of thing one i think most people mentioned that that everything being connected and i think then the second would be that your actions have like some sort of karma karmic thing that if you do something wrong and if everything is connected not just in this time and space but everything is connected with what happened before what is going to happen so space time context everything is connected and anything that you do that you will um, sort of pay for it in some way there is a consequence attached to your action as well so sustainable development i guess you know with with those as the foundations yeah uh, i agree with what everyone said uh, we have to live in harmony with nature and uh, another part is i think it, we should more move more towards local economy uh, rather than making uh, big companies bigger and uh, benefit the most uh, everyone involved must benefit uh, in one way or the other yeah Yeah, I would like to add one more point. Yeah. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, we need to have like decentralized systems. We currently have. I mean, economy. I mean, I agree to all what everybody said. Uh, yeah, interconnectedness, being nature, circular economy, and one more thing is decentralized systems, kind of local systems. Yeah. Anybody else, Pamta? I think most of them have uh, touched upon the many of the points. One thing it hits me is that what Gandhi said: uh, we don't need mass production; we need production by masses. Um, which is which also should be inclusive of all other species. Um, and uh, uh, taking more uh, nature services, uh, whatever you call services offered by biodiversity. and then um, do minimal thing uh, which does not harm the nature cycles so just follow the principles of nature align with all your action align with nature cycle is what uh, i think would sustain uh, all the species here in this wonderful planet so uh it's it's amazing all of you have said some amazing stuff and uh, if you uh actually i'm just trying to put it all in the chat i just try to capture what everyone has said uh so just to go back to my story we were uh, in this uh, kind of two day program on sustainable development in a small village there was this village elder who was sitting there from day one he didn't speak much he was listening to everybody there was some translation so he was understanding what was going on and then on the second day uh, one of the facilitators said you haven't said anything what is sustainability according to you and then he said uh, i don't know everybody is talking about technology because uh, typically when you talk about sustainability people talk about waste management and then talk about uh, energy and uh, they talk about uh, construction in some cases mobility and then we talk about other things so here this gentleman started by saying look you have been talking about all these technologies that can be fuel efficient and everything else but according to me sustainable development would be <clears throat> about 100 families deciding to live together in a village with an understanding that they are 
dependent on each other and everything else in nature around them and that which connects them and everybody else and everything else is divine for me i had this moment of you know oh my god this is like chief seattle moment we all keep quoting chief seattle right chief seattle is the most popular quotation from a native american tribe that we keep quoting in india as though we don't have our own chief seattle here for me that was amazing the way he went about defining so since then i have got stuck with this particular definition of sustainable development because sustainable development often is we talk about social socially equitable environmentally you know sustainable and uh, economically uh, feasible kind of ideas there is something fundamentally flawed about the our entire definition of what is sustainability today and here is this man putting people back in the center of the definition what he was not putting people he is putting people and relationships at the center of what is sustainability he was saying relationship is the core that people understand that they are all connected with each other and with the nature around them and that thing which connects everything is divine and the way the, the word that he used is not just divine he used the word in tam called ira unarvu which is a sense of the divine or a sacredness sanctity attached to it. that the relationship has got a sanctity attached to it that is the way he defined it. so to me this is in line with what gandhi said or what dharampal said was the same thing this villager was saying the sense of connectedness that is how the economy he is looking at so there was this complete alignment of people who have understood this at a certain level and who are articulating it at different points in time to me these are the moments when you have this wow moment and is like wow there is something there so there are so many of these wow moments in which you actually understand something about how this economy would have been organized on this country how is it that people are and i talk about it not just in terms of uh, merely uh, somewhere in the past right i'm not talking about this as you know uh, uh, this is not some vedic age something uh, you know this guru shishya parampara happened about which we can keep on arguing and uh, people will have multiple views about it this person continuous i'm talking about this is still there this is what is employing 80% of your people even today informal economy in india is the black box nobody understands how it works it is a cash economy that continues to thrive and produce jobs for such a large number of people so and why do i say that it is a high time that we articulated how do i relate it to the green economy have you seen the per capita emission in india against all other global majors every one of the cop meetings india has been arguing that our per capita emission is the lowest one of the lowest in the in fact if you actually put per capita emission of other big countries like america and china and other countries india's is so low that often we fall below the chart itself okay and india has been arguing this for pushing the net uh, net zero target to 2070 we kind of kick the bucket fa- as far a- away as possible because none of us will be around by 2070 so happily we went and said uh, 2070 we'll achieve it you know so mm-hmm. now it's so far away nobody can even imagine you know what will remain what will not remain by 2070 but then you come closer to india forget about comparing our per capita emission with america or canada or euro compare per capita emission of mumbai and chennai with the ordinary village of india 
that is when you realize who is actually subsidizing whom in this country. <laughs> we actually are subsidized. Rural India is subsidizing urban India. The informal economy of this country is actually subsidizing the very life force of the urban conglomerate student. Because I live in Chennai city. And Chennai city's per capita emission is at par with that of any other large city anywhere else in the world. And I think our per capita waste generation is the highest in the country. Uh, we cr create more waste in Chennai than any other city. We are at par with Americans. So, uh, in terms of how much we are being subsidized, if you actually compare our cities with our villages, you'll actually see that the villages are below the chart, not the cities. Right? And the villages are still in the informal economy. So, every time we go into a COP conference or every time we analyze the IPCC report and pat ourselves on the back saying, wow, our per capita emission is still very low. Basically, the people whom we need to be patting on the back are not the urban consumers or the organized economy. The unorganized rural economy of India that is subsidizing. Not just urban India, but also our claim for being one of the lowest per capita emission economies in the world. So that is where I find it is extremely important for us to understand and articulate for the sake of not just urban India, but for the sake of the entire world. It is our responsibility today to articulate how does this huge chunk of economy operate. Right? Here is an economy that seems to be employing such a large number of people that seems to be doing it without emitting further, which means it is actually sitting on ideas, concepts, practices of what we term as alternative. And most of what we term as alternative comes from the West even today. Steady state economy, donut economy, somebody mentioned, you know, and uh, Every other GI economy, even econo economies that are solidarity economy, you know, um, female economy, a number of different economic concepts, if you go into the American society, is mind boggling. And have we contributed in any way towards this from the Indian context? You know? And if every fourth person living on planet Earth is in India, Today, in American context, if somebody asks, you know, how are Indians contributing towards the global economy, they will say Indians are increasing their consumption. They are consuming as much as anybody else, so they are contributing to the global economy. Because we have become as good consumers, at least urban India has become at par consumers than the rest of the world now. That is not our contribution. We have not theoretically in any way contributed towards this knowledge, body knowledge of what economic systems can be. Unfortunately, except the few studies that were done in the early 90s, some of them have been published, we were not really challenged. There are some papers available online. In fact, uh, there is one critique that I found, uh, somebody has written, I will be you know, sharing that in the, one of the subsequent classes. Undergraduate course in India on economics, Somebody has written a critique on it saying that not a single undergraduate course on economics in India is talking about the caste system. Which means your major prevalent social structure that impacts the way economy is organized is not acknowledged in your undergraduate course. And it is only acknowledged in the postgraduate space, that too as an elective paper in economics. So, the entire economic understanding that is being taught, so basically what is happening is, that anybody who goes into economic class today in India, they are being taught all of economies, you know, microeconomy, looking at India as an individual, as a consumer, etc. And at a larger level, we look at global politics related to consumers, consumption. And caste has got nothing to do with consumption. 
Whereas if you are talking about informal economy, you will acknowledge it. You will acknowledge why inequality has a role to play. You will acknowledge how the social structures have impacted the way some people seem to be. I mean, the way, very fact, the way the urban India can get away with consuming so much more. Is there is a deep rooted casteism that is there also. And we don't understand this. Our economic theorists do not comprehend. But I would even suggest, you know, somebody wants to do a study, they should take up all the economic papers and look at how many times any form of forget caste system, any form of social theories or any form of social understanding, how far has it penetrated our think papers? Think gentlemen, whether it's Financial Times or uh, Economic Times or any of our uh, uh, economic newspapers, how frequently do they carry articles on any of these? Environment or equity or any of these areas? I would suspect not much. I haven't done it, but it will be an interesting area if somebody is a researcher here who wants to do research on some of these areas. It will be good to take a call on this and actually study this. So, uh, where we are right now uh, is in a space where many of the existing uh, Indian practices need to be theorized, not because we need to celebrate ourselves, not because we want to get into patting ourselves in the back or get romantic about you know, how great we are or any such thing. We need to do it because globally there is a need for solutions. And the West is bankrupt intellectually. They are run out of ideas. They have no further ideas to offer to the world. This I am convinced about. Because the more and more you see in the Western concept, because every one of the new alternative, quote-unquote alternatives that are emerging in the Western world, of economic theories that are emerging, consumption is taken as constant. Whereas everyone knows that if consumption is kept as constant, because I mean, for instance, the steady state economy model argues that the population be controlled and consumption is maintained at the same level. In fact, many of our existing sustainable development talks about sustaining consumption at the status quo. It doesn't talk about bringing down the consumption. And um, that is where the problem starts. The West cannot continue to consume. So during my recent visit in the US, something that I have tried to fundamentally alter is I have tried to tell them, stop, because one of the questions that I had was, okay, you are all doing sustainability. You're moving in the direction of sustainability. Tell me what is the end point of sustainability? How will a sustainable or sustained society look like? This I've been asking people. Give me a visual of, because we do this, right? If, I mean, some of you are from the corporate background, right? In corporates, we often ask this question. You know, when you're doing a vision, mission exercise, I used to do this as a consultant ages ago, you know. We ask people, you know, Tell me, give me a visual of how your company will look like 10 years from now. Right? So, I have been asking this question to my friends in the West, particularly in the US. Tell me, how do you think sustained society look like in your context? What do you think? Do you think they have an answer for it? They don't have an answer because most of them are stuck with the particular problem right now. Their problem with which they are stuck is they are worried about what will I be asked to discard in my habit, in my way of living to become sustainable? Will I be asked to reduce myself to only one car? Will I be asked to travel by public transport? You know, do I have to give up my Tesla? Uh, particularly Indians in the US are currently crazy about Tesla. You know, everybody, every second Indian seems to be the consumer of Tesla. My friend told me that uh, it's very easy. You give 500 rupees, you get a Tesla. I mean, 500 dollars, you get a Tesla. 
Uh, then you keep paying EMA for the rest of your life. And Indians are crazy about Tesla cars because it's all fancy gadget and you can show off to visiting Indians. Anyway, so the thing is, I, my question is, can we shift our thinking from talking about sustainable to that which is sustained? This is one fundamental shift that I have been wanting to bring together. Because when you say from talking about, when you say sustainability, you are talking about what can be carried, what can be dropped. When you say what is sustained, then you look at communities that have sustained the world. Communities that seem to have sustained themselves for a long period of time. They have a visual. Whether it is a Native American communities in North America or South America, whether it is African communities, whether they are communities in South Asia, whether they are in different parts of Asia, China, India. There are communities that have sustained. Instead of talking about what is sustainable, can we shift the focus to what has sustained over a long period? What are the communities that seem to have gone through different phases in their evolution? I mean, I'm not talking about history being recast because if you know, man, even Indian history has been recast on the Western model. West had an ancient history. We also have ancient history. West went through dark ages, medieval times. India also must have gone through medieval times, right? I mean, it is hilarious to find Indian historians also talk about the same parameters. Then West has modern history, so we also have modern history. So, India has been sustaining throughout. We did not have this categorization at all. And there are communities in India that have been around for a long period of time. So what sustained them? What is it that held communities together? What is it that made these communities sustain over a long period of time? What is it that made them build theories, build practices, build institutions, which actually held them together? Is there some response or is there some uh, learning from this for the current world problems? I think identifying and articulating that is a responsibility that India owes to the rest of the world, right? Not because, again, like I said, not to romanticize ourselves, but because it is a common future we are talking about. Because we need to sustain this planet and the West has grappling for solutions and they are not able to come up with anything new. We seem to be we are able to provide because our people have sustained over a long period in history. So this is one fundamental shift. I'll be talking about it. I'll uh, share some of my notes and presentations around this uh, in the forthcoming uh, sessions. The second part of what I would like to talk about is the areas in which the economy seems to be currently focusing and what could be the areas in which a focus will bring us much better uh, a greener kind of economic future what will be the areas of focus and in that context what is it that the communities of India India have been doing and have been doing over a long period this is where I would largely be presenting myself and I'm happy except maybe one person rest of you all are not students of economy because students of economy, if I have to talk to them, then I will have to do a lot more hammering of the existing economic system. You know, I don't have to indulge in that. Because I, I take extra pleasure sometimes that I get carried away by that. I am a big critique of the existing university system and what we teach in economy or any subject in the Indian universities. So sometimes I end up taking too much time doing that. In this case, I hope I don't have to do, do that because I think except one person, everybody else said that they hadn't gone to economic class. So I don't have to do that. But 
most critical for me is uh, for us to today recognize that we do owe this to uh, a larger planet. We do need to create this. And uh, with that view, um, some of us have uh, worked on uh, setting together a portal called Green Economy India, where we are trying to bring together a whole lot of these ideas. I will talk about it at length tomorrow. Uh, and I will stop maybe in another couple of minutes. Any questions you have, you can, you can clarify that. So the next couple of minutes, I just want to wrap up. Uh, from my side, what I want to share with you is like many of the things that you people have mentioned from Gandhi to Kumarapa to how this economic understanding can be structured, what are the concepts that seems to be working. All these things are part of the course. And uh, I have been, in my own way, what I have been trying to do is link it from the ethical principles that govern us all the way to the practices that I find among ordinary people and institutions that are run and managed by the people of this country. Not the mega structures of monolithic bureau and corporates or how that system is done. So this is what I will be sharing as part of this course. And I have invited a few people who have tried to theorize this or who are practicing this to be part of the course and come and share their insights. So for instance, we have, uh, uh, I think tomorrow I have requested Nirmal and I, who is, uh, she manages a school for practical sustainability in, Copen, uh, in uh, Cape Town in South Africa. She's an Indian who has been based out of South Africa for about 10, 15 years now, but she comes from a very deep commitment in the Indian context and she's been engaging with the global economic system and talking about green economy for a long time. And she's a big critique of the entire movement and the Western idea of green economy. So she will be joining us tomorrow and she will join further later on also uh, for a full course. I have requested Sumanas. Uh, if somebody is in Mysore, right? Who's in Mysore now? Somebody said who's in Mysore. Yes, in Mysore, yes. So, uh, Sumanas Kaulagi lives in Melkote near Mysore. He's a scholar who has been theorizing. He's a third generation Gandhian institution based out of Melkote. And uh, he has uh, recently theorized uh, the Gandhian way of economic thought process, Gandhi Kumarapa practice into a theory. And his book is just out uh, called uh, uh, Swaraj's Development. So he will be joining us. Meenakshi from Kobidam School will be joining us. Uh, Baskar, who's already there today, he will be with us uh, later during the camp. And uh, there are a few others who might be joining us as well. Uh, Anantu has agreed to be part of this course. Anantu is uh, founder of uh, Tula, this uh, amazing enterprise that uh, works on a complete supply chain, end-to-end -end supply chain on cotton and has created a completely new brand altogether. There are a few more who will be joining us during this time. So this is broadly what I have in mind. I, I will share the entire curriculum details and the breakdown with you in the course tomorrow. Today, I wanted to primarily use this as a way of introducing. Consciously, I have been wanting to introduce this course through storytelling first before I get into concept presentation. Again, that's conscious effort on my part to use the first session only for storytelling. And I hope I have been able to share a few stories with you. I'll share a lot more uh, as we proceed further. But uh, any questions, any clarifications you have, you can start now. I will stop with this. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very, this is Guru here. Thank you for this very informative talk. I do agree with many of the points that you had kind of raised about, especially yeah. about our village economy being uh, 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 more sustainable than our urban economy. Uh, now, I had a, probably a counter question on uh, or a distinct clarification on that. 
uh, wanted to understand better. See, when we were also kids, basically uh, been in urban situation because in Bob is in Bombay, born and brought up in Bombay. Okay. So a lot of these things, uh, 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 practices which we used to do in Bombay at the time were, were fairly sustainable in the, in the way we come. And most of these were driven not from the thought of sustainability, but more from uh, uh, necessity, right? Uh, lack of resources, lack of this thing. So uh, using of Dalda tins basically for uh, as containers, okay, even saving each uh, plastic cover, uh, milk cover, newspaper, all these things basically, clothes, we, everything was recycled, everything was this thing, right? And food, habits, everything. Now, uh, over a period of time, as we started becoming more and more uh, 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 prosperous or uh, this thing, right? A lot of these practices started giving away, okay? And we started moving more and more towards the Western model of consumption and uh, this thing, right? And so now, taking this kind of a background, okay? So, so earlier, the way I understood uh, our urban rural, probably the difference was not much. Now the uh, urban areas have become to the level of uh, uh, Western economies or Western societies. Now, we are also looking at a situation here now where even our rural areas, all these things are coming in, right? Be it automobile, electricity. So far, there were a lot of constraints in terms of availability. Now, you're going to have, you're having sewage, you're having uh, uh, water coming in, uh, electricity consumption, ACs. So now when you go to the villages also, you start seeing all of these coming in, right? So how does this kind of play out? So uh, uh, what will happen is if, if our rural communities also start becoming like the urban communities in, in, a, in a way. So how do we lose, uh, maintain whatever you're talking about, the lowest? Yeah. Uh, one thing is either the urban can have or rural can have. Mm. Or they have to fight it out and some one of them have to die. Mm. Okay. Or we need to figure out a balancing way in which people live in their own comfort spaces. Mm. Because uh, if rural economy wants to develop and have all the resources of an urban economy, uh, we need... <laughs> Gandhi during his time said if uh, all of India wants to live like the Americans do, we need six planets resources of six planets. Today, we probably need resources of 30 planets for us to survive. I'm giving you a maybe exaggerated number. Maybe it may not be 30. It may not be 10. It may be 10 or 15 or whatever. Even the equivalent, <clears throat> like uh, you might be aware that recently we have started saying uh, lithium is available in the Himalayas. Hmm. The scariest of our part for me is to start mining the Himalayas for lithium. Yes. Okay. So, all this Kailash Manasarovar Yatra has to be given up by people now. Mm. Because we need to drive uh, battery-driven two-wheelers. But uh, one of my pet topics, uh, which I will come to in one of the subsequent classes, is uh, <coughs> a title of... Actually, I wrote a title as a chapter in a book that I never completed, really. Um the chapter title was How Were We When We Were Rich? It's not as though India was not materially rich before. Mm. It's not as though we did not have resources before. But something happened between the earlier idea of richness to what we are today, the current idea of prosperity. Somewhere down the line, <laughs> we missed something that has resulted in creating uh, a form of consumerist society today that identifies its consumption as a sign of prosperity. And there are still communities in India 
that do not uh, necessarily subscribe to this. For me, one of the most amazing visuals of this is uh, I was in the deep in the heart of uh, Madhya Pradesh in a forest in Amarkantak, where the Narmada River originates. And uh, there is this Vidya Sagarji Maharaj, a Jain Muni of the Dikambar sect. And some of the wealthiest Jains in the country are his followers. So, uh, the Digambars, as you know, the Digambar monks, the Jains, they don't wear any clothing. They are nude. So, I was once called. <laughs> I went and had about four or five days with uh, Vidya Sagarji Maharaj. For me, it's a most telling thing about this society. I mean, when I came back, for me, the most interesting thing was a society that actually where the most prosperous, most wealthy people from Delhi, Mumbai, everywhere, go and prostrate before this nude old monk who wears nothing, carries nothing, doesn't eat more than once a day, and that too, only three handfuls of food, and who basically is not dependent on just about anything. If we continue to celebrate these monks as worthy of being revered, I think all is not lost in India. I remember somewhere reading that you know, India is the only country where we have at least a million monks or uh, sannyasis going around highly unproductive. They don't contribute in any way to the economy. And we continue to sustain them. They live off the rest of society. I think there is a potential in that. I think we need to really look at... Uh, yeah, I'll come back to that. This is a very important question that you raised. How do we handle wealth? What is it to be prosperous? What is a sign of prosperity? And how do we... Well, I'm not saying that we are currently in the right trajectory. If you are the right trajectory, if I had advertised this course by saying, you know, like... Uh, we have this magazine called Pasumai Vigatan in Tamil Nadu. Their constant advertisement is saying, you know, become an organic farmer, get a turnover of one crore in one year. Now, if anybody is an organic farmer, they will know one crore one year is impossible. Yes. And that is not desirable also. But this magazine is made a style out of it. You know? All their magazine titles, the cover page story will always be saying, you know, become an organic farmer. I earn one crore, two crore in a year, that kind of thing. So, if you make that kind of money, you can't be an organic farmer to begin with. So, at some level, I think it is important for us to recognize and regain the ethical system. It is not about just the idea of we need to alter the way the prosperity is measured. And what I would try to argue and probably convince you all, if possible, through this program is that it is not as far away and as difficult as sometimes we envisage it. The remnants of it is all around us. It is not too alien to us. It is there in every family. It is there in every brotherhood. It is there in every neighborhood in some small way. It's just that we do not acknowledge it. We do not put it together and we do not theorize it into another form of understanding with which we can actually relook at ourselves with a lot more optimism than the pessimism sometimes that provides us. That the is what I will go to. Yeah. The other that aspect of this also is that uh, uh, if you see, we have lost or we are losing rapidly many of these traditional knowledge systems. Uh, I'll just give you an example of what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, earlier, when I in my village, I uh, when we go there, uh, I come from a village uh, in Chittur, Kerala, Palakkad district of Kerala. Okay, so there every house is constructed in a certain way with sloping roofs. There are gutters, 
and uh, the entire water basically gets accumulated in the center of the house, which is called Kudam. And from there, there is a well uh, which accumulates the water. So, uh, and then whatever excess water is that flows, it goes into the uh, roads, which are all sandy, which again percolates. And then from there, it percolates into the uh, village tank. So you had multiple levels of water this thing. Similarly, uh, if all the bath water is channelized uh, directly into the backyard to coconut trees and other other things. So only the uh, this waste, uh, uh, human excreted waste, is going into a septic tank. Okay. So so we had systems which basically. Uh, uh, created and made it kind of built into sort of water cycle, uh, waste management, everything built into. Even the cook cooking waste used to compost and put it basically. Compost, they don't compost it, they're directly, the peels are all either fed to the cows or given uh, on the trees directly. So now if you look at a lot of these village houses are being demolished and we build similar concrete structures where we are getting pipe water from our off, uh, putting sewage and taking sewage out basically without treating and then nobody knows where, which is, and which is again entering back into the water system. So we are losing all of these knowledge systems and knowledge based things which were working for centuries, our water system, uh, and yeah. we are struggling with water uh, security, all of these issues. So would you be also covering some of these aspects? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, uh, traditional knowledge system by itself is a huge area. What you mentioned about construction is one side of it. There is also town planning, which is another side of it. Uh, one could go into several aspects of it, from healthcare to talking about wellness to holistic understanding of uh, mm. uh, human, including organization theories, every aspect of it one can think about. I would like to limit myself in this course only to talk about the economic aspects, because much of my learning comes from studying traditional institutions. So I would like to limit to that. But uh, having said that, I would also like to point out that uh, something that one very senior monk once told me. I used to, at least 10, 15 years ago, I used to keep bemoaning about all these traditional knowledge systems that are getting lost, etc. And once I was in a monastery and uh, I was called to talk in the evening after their prayers. They asked me to give a lecture. So after I finished the lecture, the senior monk was sitting at the back and listening to me. They said, yeah, you spoke so much about traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge systems and how they are all getting lost, etc. I said, yes, it's a real threat. <clears throat> and then he looks at me and says, you know, this is India. I said, yes. As long as we sustain this capacity, to meditate, every one of these knowledge systems can be recreated. I don't know whether I agree with him even today, but I appreciated his optimism. He felt that we, as long as we have the capacity to meditate, we will be able to recreate every one of these knowledge systems. And to me, it made sense at some level because <clears throat> what do you mean by meditation? who are in sync with the rest of all that is in nature. If one were to look at that capacity to reflect with nature, and this is the second point, again, I didn't want to get into that today, but uh, because you alluded to it, I have to say this. One of the challenges and one of the things that I have told people in the West, particularly this time during my visit there is, if we think that human activity alone created climate change as a problem, that is bad enough. It is audacity on our part to assume that we will be the only ones, the only human activity will fix it. 
Hmm. Nature is going to fix it. Yeah. Not just human activity alone. And one of the fastest areas of science that is really emerging today. Over the last 10 years, an area of science that has substantially grown, which is going to have a big impact on us, is plant intelligence. We don't see, we seem to have underestimated the intelligence of plants. Not just Peter Wollenbaum's uh, series of books that have repeatedly alluded to plant intelligence, but there are a whole lot of research material that has come about in the last five years from across the world on plant intelligence. A friend of mine in the US shared with me about uh, bioacoustics. And something that he mentioned, I mean, we know this already. At some level, our mythology already captures it. He said uh, one of the new areas of science that is emerging is bioacoustics. And in bioacoustics, one of the things that they have found is that elephants communicate with each other through noise, through sound. And it is of such low frequency that humans cannot hear about it. And because it's such low frequency, it travels long distances. And one of the things that they discovered was that elephants actually have names for other individual elephants. That when they communicate, a certain sound is made that actually reaches the, a part, is referred to a particular other elephant. Because we are reaching kind of end of our scheduled time today, I would like to leave you with this thought. Nirmala Nair, uh, who will join us tomorrow, spoke about something similar from South African context, which they found out about uh, the fungi uh, that grow the forest floor. So one of the... What the, the larger point that I want to make is humans cannot continue to believe that they are going to fix the global problem of climate change. Yes, we need to do some changes, but we are not alone in this. And a lot of things that we have understood through our traditional knowledge systems come from working in close resonance with natural systems. As long as we retain the capacity to go back and work with the natural systems, we'll be able to recreate the traditional knowledge. Today, I have reached that understanding in terms of being far more optimistic. Though if you ask me, do you have a solution for all of them? I should confess I have been. I don't think anybody else I know actually has all the solutions for it. But definitely, I'm far more optimistic thanks to what this monk told me many years ago. And what I have come to subsequently realize myself. So I would like to uh, bring this session to a close because it's one o'clock and uh, one or two. We started at uh, eleven or three, so it's like exactly two hours. I don't want to take up more of your time. I have been one thing I have recognized is virtual sessions need to start on time. I'm not on if they don't start on time. They have to Sorry. close on time. Ah, Baskar, please. Hmm. You want to say uh, something? So, uh, I was just sensing oh, that, uh, can we take ah. it to the next session if it's okay? Because we also have another call on this. Zoom oh, call. okay, okay. Yeah. Fine. So, so, Baskar, can yeah. you do it tomorrow? One minute, I'm going to ask you. I don't know how to talk about this. I don't know நம்ம இங்க கோர்ஸ்ல கொண்டு போற விஷயம் நான் ஒரு ரெண்டு லைன் யோசிச்சிருக்கிறேன் இப்போ இந்த செஷன் முழுக்க உட்காந்து கேட்டதுல முதல் விஷயம் தனக்கோ பிறருக்கோ சூழலுக்கோ கேடு விளைவிக்க விளைவிக்க வகை விளைவிக்காத வகையில நாம் எப்படி வாழ போறோம் எப்படி நுகர போறோம் அப்படிங்கிற கேள்வி அதுல இருந்தா இந்த பசுமை பொருளாதாரத்துக்கு வித்திட முடியும்னு ஒன்று தெரியுது இன்னொன்னு வந்து டெக்னிக்ஸ விட ப்ராசஸ் மேலையும் சொல்றது சொல்யூஷனுக்கு போறத விட ப்ராப்ளம் புரிஞ்சுக்கிறது ஒரு தொண்ணூறு பர்சன்டேஜ் ஆனால் சொல்யூஷன் ஆயிருக்கும் அப்படிங்கிறதுனால தான் தொடர்ச்சியாக நம்ம பேசுறோம் நிறைய பேர் என் பிரச்சனையே பேசுறீங்கன்னு கேட்பாங்க பிரச்சனையை புரியாம சொல்லப்படுற தீர்வு எல்லாமே மீண்டும் ஒரு பிரச்சனையா மாறும் 
அந்த சுழற்சி உடையாது அப்படிங்கிறதையும் புரிஞ்சுக்கணும் இந்த ரெண்டு விஷயம் மட்டும் எம்பசைஸ் பண்ணி சொல்லிட்டு எம்சை நிறைவு கருத்தாகவும் வாழ்த்தாகவும் இந்த குழுக்கு சொல்லிடலாம் நினைக்கிறேன் முதல் விஷயம் தனக்கோ பிறருக்கோ சூழலுக்கோ கேடு விளைவிக்காத வகையில தன்னுடைய நுகர்வையும் வாழ்வையும் எப்படி நகர்த்திக்கிறது அது அதை நோக்கி நகர்றது சஸ்டைனபிலிட்டி அப்படிங்கிறத பத்தி பேசுறதுக்கு இது ஒரு முக்கிய கருவா இருக்கும் ரெண்டாவது ப்ராசஸ் பத்தி நிறைய பேச போறோம் அந்த ப்ராசஸ்ல பேசும்பொழுது சொல்யூஷனை பத்தி பேசாம இருக்கிற இன்னைக்கு இருக்கக்கூடிய பிரச்சனைக்கு அஹ் இதுக்கு முன்னாடி நம்ம கிட்ட சொல்யூஷன் இருந்தா அதை எடுக்க போறோம் இல்லைன்னா புதுசா உருவாக்க போறோம் ரெண்டுமே தேவையா இருக்கு எல்லாத்துக்கும் பழசுல தீர்வு இருக்கு அப்படின்னு நம்மளால பிளைண்டா நம்பிடவும் முடியாது சிலது நம்ம உருவாக்க வேண்டியதும் இருக்கு பழச வேணா அடிப்படையா வச்சுக்கலாம் ஒரு ஆல்பெட் மாதிரி இது ரெண்டும் புரிஞ்சுக்க வேண்டிய அவசியம் இருக்கு இந்த ஓவரால் இந்த செஷன் முழுக்கவுமே இதை மையமா வச்சு யோசிப்போம்னு நினைக்கிறேன் இது ரெண்டு தான் இந்த தொடர்ச்சியா ரெண்டு மணி நேரம் கவனிச்சுல சொல்லணும்னு நினைச்சுனா வாய்ப்புக்கு நன்றி Thanks, thanks, Baskar. So, the two points that Baskar made, I'll come back to it and start with it tomorrow's session. So, Adil will bring this to a close here. Thank you, everybody. And uh, it's good that we close with the Tamil part. I don't know how many of you understand Tamil. Even if you don't understand, it's good to listen to diverse forms of languages. I will encourage all of you to, if you're comfortable in any other language that we can organize for translation, please do. Don't hesitate. So, one of the... most important things is to i think get used to people expressing themselves in comfort spaces or comfort languages you know, first and foremost we end up often in a simple way of everybody trying to coerce their thoughts into a new form of language which you can avoid so see you all tomorrow we will continue with the orientation tomorrow and then the main sessions i'll outline the entire detail course i have a presentation that i'll run through tomorrow so thank you all for listening patiently and being there hope to continue the journey thank you one question i'll leave uh, adil if you don't mind just half a say half a minute more uh before you come tomorrow i want you to all of you to just work on this one problem and get back to me i gave this exercise recently in a classroom to a bunch of students and they came up with some amazing insights all of us do economic transactions every day right please reflect on any economic transaction that you did in which you found love where is love in your account in any of the transactions that you do in a day to day basis think for think of it reflect on it come back to with the thought Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ramana. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hope, to Hope to see you all again tomorrow, again tomorrow at the same time, 7 a.m. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.